Professor Miranda Wolpert, MBE, has a long experience of working on research in mental health, and she's now the head of the mental health priority area at the Wellcome Trust. Now, for those of you who were here yesterday, this is the same pattern. Miranda uh, will talk for about 40 minutes, then there'll be about 20 minutes for your questions on her talk, then there's a choice of options, which I'll, I'll go through later, but one of which is to stay on and meet the keynote and, and ask her other questions. Um, once again, please send in your questions uh, via Slido, uh, not the Zoom chat. So that means you can do it on your phone or tablet aside from your, your computer. You go to slido.com and the event code is hashtag 2020. We had great questions yesterday, so do keep those uh, coming in. You can also fill in feedback there after uh, the sessions as well. Um, and thank you for the uh, general questions that you've been sending in for me as well, in case we have a moment where there is uh, broadband not working somewhere. When um, So I'm very happy happy to answer questions about my work presenting all in the mind or writing books uh, for a general audience or tips on being interviewed if you want to talk about your research anything like that um, again if we're lucky those questions will uh, remain unanswered because everything will work um, and it did yesterday which was really nice now uh, Miranda is going to talk about a lovely idea a world where no one is held back by mental health problems which would be a really great thing to see so please welcome Professor Miranda Walcott Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, how Welcome is trying to help create a world in which no one is held back by mental health problems. And we are uh, unapo unapologetically calling it a radical new approach to addressing anxiety and depression in young people or finding ways to address that. Um, and as Claudia kindly said, I'm Miranda Wolpert. I'm a clinical psychologist by background, haven't worked clinically for many years now, have worked in academia and in policy and in charities and in change making and can talk all about um, some of those things but for the last year I've had the immense privilege of working at the Wellcome Trust and I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing and uh, what we're aiming to do. So for those who don't know the Wellcome Trust um, is a, it sits in, normally in non-COVID times in a big modern building on the Euston Road and if you look at the left of the screen you can see our wonderful um, atrium which is called the street where lots of uh, informal meetings happen and all sorts of good ideas are created. And at the top, you can see our wonderful chief executive, Jeremy Farrer, who some of you will have seen on Newsnight and elsewhere as he's been very involved in the COVID um, initiatives in response to it and is a, a very inspirational leader to have. Uh, the Wellcome is the world's second largest uh, biomedical research funder, and it's dedicated to um, uh, uh, to tackling the most urgent global health challenges to create a world in which we can all thrive. And to do that, it's got a whole wealth of assets and approaches. So it gives out about a billion a year in science funding, but it also has a museum on the side, does cultural research and um, uh, also innovation, and it develops new models of public and policy engagement. So it's, it's quite an interesting beast and I feel very lucky to be there. Um, it also very much encourages those of us who work there to um, share our ideas freely and, and it's very unedited in what we're allowed to do. So I'm encouraged to share ideas through LinkedIn and through Twitter. And I would really encourage you to engage with me through either of those mediums because we really do want to be engaging with the wider community as possible. So um, I've given my Twitter handle and a lot of what I'm going to refer to are come from LinkedIn blogs um, that I hope that you will have a look at and see if they're of interest to you. So I have the incredibly uh, lucky task of presiding over what's called the Mental Health Priority Area, which is a 10 year programme, which already has five years uh, of money committed to it. So Welcome has committed £200 million, and I have the task to give that away over the next five years. And if you look at the link at the bottom of the slide, it will show you, um, it will show you to our website where it talks about our strategy and what our strategy is for how we're going to give out that money. Uh, the programme is, as I say, for 10 years. It started in January of this year and it runs till 2030. And our focus is on anxiety and depression in young people aged between 14 to 24 year olds and globally. And I think it's important to say here that's not because we think these are the only people that are important or indeed necessarily the most important, but we felt it was really important to focus somewhere most mental health problems start in youth. We appreciate there may be a lot of importance in focusing even earlier, but we felt it was important to focus somewhere. So our focus on 14 to 24 year olds, anxiety and depression globally. And our focus is on how we can 
do one of four things, or possibly all four of them. Prevent problems arising, treat problems when they have arisen, stop people relapsing when they've recovered from a problem, and managing ongoing difficulties if they have ongoing problems. And I think it's important to say here that we're quite keen on trying to think in terms of those four different categories. And we think sometimes the field has got a bit confused about whether it's talking about prevention or treatment or stopping relapse or managing ongoing difficulties. So those distinctions are something that I'd be very interested to see whether they resonate with other people. So when I came in post, um, which was in May of last year, one of the first things I did was to start to engage with the community around whether what our ambition should be for this program. Would it be right to be thinking about how do we cure mental health problems? And I published a blog on this saying, you know, perhaps we should sort of aim to cure all mental health problems by 2030 or something like that. And I got some very interesting feedback. So uh, from a very small uh, survey we did, um, had some questions about whether cure was a good term or not and why it might be good or not. Um, my computer's gone sufficiently quiet, which makes me think I'm about to lose power. I'm just going to plug in before we move on. Hold on a second. Already I can see uh, challenges ahead. Right, that should help. So, um, I think one of the issues here was that for some people, cure uh, represented hope and optimism and potential for change. And I think some people would say it's helpful in terms of if we're competing for funding, for example, with uh, things like cancer, actually saying we can cure things, we can improve people's lives was very helpful. On the other hand, there's also issues around people saying, well, actually, these issues are much more complex. For some people, they may be lifelong and focusing down on cure may actually reduce some of the complexity and lose the perspective of some people who are managing ongoing difficulties. So in response to that, this is our vision, a world in which no one is held back by mental health problems. And we picked that vision very deliberately because we are really interested in helping people lead, lead the fullest lives they can. We are much less interested in having debates about what is a mental health problem and what isn't a mental health problem, or indeed, or perhaps more controversially, what causes a mental health problem. And I'm gonna talk a bit more about why we are trying to avoid, to some extent, debates about cause and focus relentlessly on conversations about solutions, whether they're at the level of prevention or treatment or stopping relapse or managing ongoing difficulties. So we've all just seen that incredibly powerful piece by Sana Hassan. And I've just seen, uh, apologies, Sana, if you're watching, that I've got your uh, surname spelt wrong, so apologies. That was sent to me yesterday, and I sent round to my team saying, this fantastic video is going up just before me. How on earth am I going to follow this? What do people think we're doing currently that rises to the challenges that Sana um, uh, is posing to us? And very appropriate and fair challenges. And Laura McGrath, our fantastic project support officer, was one of the people who wrote back to me. And this is what she put in her email. At the end, Sanna says, there is healing to be found in our community. And we as a priority area are truly invested into looking into culturally appropriate, community-based, peer-led interventions to improve the mental health of young people. We aren't yet sure what works for depression and anxiety. For too long, the history of mental health has been dominated by medication and criminalization, as Sana mentioned, without truly trying to understand the what works for whom and the context in which people find themselves and how this impacts on people's mental health. We're currently looking into active ingredients, and I'm going to talk a lot more about this shortly, for mental health that cover everything from social connectedness to exposure to nature to theatre and arts and are hearing from our lived exp experience expert advisors that they want us to interrogate how the legacy of things like colonialism impacts young people's mental health globally. So this is something we're exploring. So with Laura's permission, I said I'd just share that email straight away because I think that is exactly where we're coming from. We are very clear we haven't got all the answers. And uh, if, if Sana is on the, um, in this uh, event, it'll be fantastic to hear from you and to have more challenge and commentary on this but it is something that we are very alive to and wanting to address. 
So for us, putting lived experience at the heart of our work is a real uh, wish and a real endeavor. And we're sure we'll get it wrong in many, many ways, but we are certainly trying. So our, our fantastic lived experience and public engagement lead, Dr. Kate Martin, started with us in January of this year. And with her, we have been now creating a network of uh, those with lived experience of mental health problems, particularly anxiety and depression, and particularly young people who are helping us in a range of ways, both in terms of our governance, in terms of our funding, in terms of thinking about what we fund and in terms of planning future funding. So two uh, particular youth advisors who are working particularly closely with us currently are Grace Gutera from Rwanda and Josiah Tula Mali from uh, New Zealand, um, uh, both of whom are on our strategic advisory board and have been involved with us in various of our initiatives currently. And they're part of a wider group that Kate's convening, uh, thinking with us about how we can ensure that lived experience is at the heart of all we do. So here are some direct quotes from an event, uh, from a meeting that Kate, Grace, Josiah, and other youth advisors were involved in a couple of days ago, where Kate was starting to talk with the youth advisors around what their hopes are for our program. And here's, here are some of the things they said, that they hope that this work can help create a space where the next generation of advocates, youth mental health researchers, and young mental health policymakers are able to hone and develop their skills that they want us to take forward innovative practices in policy and research and advocacy that are based in the lived experience of the communities that we work with and that don't simply answer to the institutions that have largely governed this behaviour in the past. That they want us to develop a global community of practice for work that would have an impact going forward for future generations. And they want us to make knowledge that we are generating as inclusive and as accessible as possible. And in particular, they set us the challenge of trying to set standards for that great research is judged by its impact, and in particular, how it can give knowledge and power directly into the hands of young people, rather than impact only being measured by numbers of publications and impact factors of journals. So those are the challenges we're trying to rise to. We've got three pronged work plan to do this. The first is we wanted, and you know, they're all pretty ambitious. The first is we want to transform mental health science. The second is we want to unleash the power of population data. And the third is we want to collaborate to advance policy and funding. For the rest of this talk, I'm going to largely focus on the first and on one aspect of the first. So at this point, I just want to mention a couple of things about the other two so that people can ask me questions or those who want to have a shorter lunch can have a more detailed discussion with me after the talk. In terms of unleashing the power of population data, we have a call out at the moment and we're just in the process of selecting a data bank supplier who will be working with us to create a novel sort of data bank that will collect and in a way try new ways of filing the feelings that Sana was talking about, but not just the feelings, the ways that people manage and cope and find ways through to recovery or ongoing management. Um, and that will be launched within the next year. We're trialing that for the next year and seeing how that works. Very happy to talk more about that. This, uh, in terms of collaborating, we're looking with policymakers and funders to bring new funding into this field and also to bring new narratives around policy to try and ensure that science informs policy in new ways, but also that policymakers are given the tools they need to make informed decision about what works for whom and in what context. So having said that, I'm going to move on to talking about how we're hoping to transform mental health science. So this may be quite a familiar cartoon to some of you. It was the front page of the New Yorker in 1976. And as my colleague who I shared this with today said, uh, the main thing she was noticed was the price of the New Yorker then, as opposed to now. I don't buy the New Yorker, so I have no idea what the price hike difference is. But this shows a view of someone standing in the center of New York and how they see the world. And you can see for them, the buildings most close to them, I think it's probably Saks and other sort of department stores, loom very large and are very detailed. The further it gets away from their own parochial world, the, bit, the more sketchy it gets. So that places like Japan, China and Russia are just very vague, vague blobs on their horizon. And this is a cartoon by Saul Steinbeck. Steinberg, rather. I think this is an interesting metaphor for us in mental health science. 
So there are many different ways of thinking about the communities currently in mental health science. But I think on one thing we can be pretty much agreed, they're siloed and fragmented. Here are four particular groupings that you could think about how you might file these particular mental health scientists. And each one has their own limited perspective, despite them being passionate and concerned and wanting to find the best. There are those interested in brain science who have a perspective looking at how brains work and trying to understand mental health problems in terms of that uh, viewpoint. There are those looking at intervention science who have a perspective of trying to understand how treatments work and bring their own viewpoint to that. There are those interested in developmental science who look at how things change over time and try and understand points of continuity and discontinuity. And then there's the growing world of data science that is trying to look at how different bits of information link together and what patterns we can draw in the data. Now, you may have your own categorizations. I've played with 12, 4, 3, 10 different ways of grouping mental health science. These four make sense to me, but I'm in no way saying they are the end word. What I would say is within each of these groups, not only are they silos between the groups, but within the groups, there is a lack of consistency about how we talk about things, how we share knowledge and how we understand things. And I think in part because mental health science has been so um, marginalized for so long, those of us who have been working in mental health science have sort of had to campaign for it and that's meant that many people are sort of very passionate advocates for their particular brand or their particular way of seeing the world. And that's meant that we've got caught in some quite difficult debates and it's been quite hard to find neutral science that, that goes across these different areas. And I guess that's what we're trying to do to create uh, non-hubristically a super science of mental health science, which brings a wider community together. Of course, the difficulty is that none of us like to give up on our existing ideas or identity. And I am definitely with that panda. So this is a challenge for all of us um, and something that we've all got to find ways to rise to. So welcome is taking a very broad definition of what we mean by science. So broad that some would say that we should just stop calling it science, we should call it something else, but I feel unapologetic about calling it science. So rather than relying solely on say, psychiatry, psychology and neuroscience, we seek to include a fuller spectrum of approaches, including economics, anthropology, humanities, and social sciences. And I was very heartened to see, for example, that the new uh, head of the British Academy is now pioneering this term shape for the um, social humanities and uh, social sciences. So we really believe that for, for mental health science to progress, we need all these brains, all these viewpoints involved. And anything that looks at rigorously at evidence, we want to include as science. So uh, mental health science for us includes any discipline that uses evidence in a rigorous way. We're focusing on what helps people thrive, recover or manage, as opposed to what debates about what caused the difficulty in the first place. And we're preoccupied by trying to find some common metrics to allow us to have a more of a common language about some of these key issues. We're interested in a wide range of subjects and on drawing on people with lived experience as part of that scientific community and creating an open and facilitative research culture. And we want to try and do away with the idea that there are hierarchies of methodology. So for example, we would say discovery science has to look at social structure as much as it does at bio biology. There is no hierarchy here, it's all about rigor. So moving to measurement, we are not unalive to the complexities of how we measure things. And this feels like my career for the last 20 years before I joined Welcome in trying to find what's the best way to measure mental health outcomes for young people. Um, and I think rising again to Sana's challenge, we take anxiety and depression to be loose verbal descriptions of constellations of thoughts, feelings and behaviors that exist on a continuum and have been classified as entities almost entirely by historical consensus. By that, we don't think that means they don't exist. We think people are genuinely being held back by a whole range of thoughts, feelings and behaviours that we have come to lump together in these categories. But we do think having much debate about where the boundaries are between these categories is not necessarily helpful since the we made up the categories and then we debate about 
who fits into them. So we're interested in anyone who is being held back from their goals in life by the loose constellation of thoughts, feelings and behaviours that are categorised under anxiety and depression. And by those thoughts, feelings, behaviours, we mean the sorts of things that are measured by common measures such as the PHQ or the GAD. So having little interest or pleasure in doing things, feeling down, depressed or hopeless, having trouble going to sleep, feeling tired or having little energy, or feeling very nervous, worrying too much about different things, not being able to relax, being unable to concentrate, feeling worthless, and those having impacts on people's functioning and ability to get on with their daily lives. That's how we are considering anxiety and depression. And we're hoping within the next week or so to be able to announce some work with other funders around agreeing common metrics around that that will give us a common starter point, which will be along the lines in this slide. In order to move forward, not only do we need common measurement, we need science narratives and policies that help us both understand how and support people to live with or recover from mental health problems. So this was some Googling I did uh, uh, early on when I was in post around trying to look at what currently comes up if you put in uh, for depression in Google. And as you can see, it's a pretty bleak set of pictures. For some reason, the color is not there and they're quite similar and they're called the head clutch, which sometimes we refer to them as the head clutch of pictures. Now that's not to say they don't resonate with some experiences of depression. So I don't want to demonize or do down these, these pictures, but if they're the only pictures we have, they don't perhaps represent the full range of experiences or indeed the experiences of recovery or moving through. Similarly for anxiety, uh, we have a range of pictures very focused in the head. Welcome runs an annual uh, photography prize, which invites um, people to put in photographs around a number of topics. In 2019, one of the winners was this uh, wonderful picture of Alan, and the category here was around epidemics, and the Jude Wax who took this picture, put in this picture around uh, what she termed the teenage ap epidemic of self-harm. This year, the Welcome Prize, Welcome Photography Prize is going to be even more around mental health and focused in particular on anxiety and depression. And it'll be really interesting to see um, uh, what wins the, that prize and we'll have some pictures coming forward. From my point of view, I think it's really crucial that we move away from the binary division between debates about different causes. Is it social? Is it biological? Or indeed between different treatments? Is it something a professional provides? Is it something that a non-professional provides? From my point of view, we want to start as if those, those binary debates don't exist and rather think about what helps who in what context. If we can understand why that's fantastic, but we're mainly focused on what helps rather than trying to understand cause. So in January of this year, we launched our program. And the first thing we did was to launch a call for what we called insight analysis on what we called at the time core components, but we're now calling active ingredients. And by active ingredients, we mean those aspects of any intervention, whether it's preventing or treating or stopping relapse or managing ongoing difficulties, that are thought to be most likely to contribute to or make a difference to the outcome. So as you can see from the uh, graph on the right or the table on the right, those can range from the biological to the behavioral to the relationship to the societal. And these were examples we gave that we sourced from the literature and said to people, we put out a call to the research community saying, give us your best bets. Which one of these? We only allow people to choose one. We know it's complicated. We know we'll need many. But at this moment, we wanted people just to choose one. Which one of these would you put your best bet on as being an active ingredient worthy of study to help the most people in the most ways globally to either prevent, treat, stop relapse or manage ongoing difficulties for anxiety and depression for 14 to 24 year olds. And all this is available on LinkedIn. There's the, the link at the bottom of the slide you can see and you can see the more uh, context around this. We also did a small survey for people just saying, OK, out of that list so far, which ones would you say is your top? And just for interest, the top ones that came up for prevention was social connection for depression, 
and economic and social security for anxiety. And for treatment, it was learning to deal with negative emotions and thoughts for depression and not avoiding feared experience of things for anxiety. Again, all of that and the full detail of that you can find on LinkedIn. We then uh, uh, put out this call for the active ingredients and we had 200 applications in. We worked in ter with internal colleagues, um, including from other parts of Welcome and with our youth advisors to winnow that down. And from that, we chose 30, um, sorry, uh, 26 uh, key active ingredients to be focused on for insight analysis to happen between now and October 2020. And we've commissioned 30 teams to work on these active ingredients. So as you can see, uh, most people did not make a distinction between stopping relapse and ongoing management, so we haven't really included that category so much. We've included the category of prevention and intervention. We've included the category of prevention only, and we've concluded the category of intervention only. Most looked at both depression and anxiety, but some are looking just at depression, some are looking just at anxiety. Just to be clear, just because the team is looking only at anxiety or only at depression doesn't mean it, that active ingredient might not be relevant for another context. This just gives a summary of the context in which the teams are looking. We're aware there are gaps here, and in particular, uh, in the light of recent conversations, aware there are gaps around um, uh, structural injustice uh, and whether that can how that how addressing that might help. Um, either prevent or treat anxiety and depression. So there are a range of things we're thinking about and we'll be doing this um, initiative again next year and trying to fill some of those gaps. Having said that, we're not looking to expand this list massively. We know that generally all of us as academics will always add more. What we want to do is get down to a small focal number that Welcome will focus with the research community on which feel like the most important to focus on for this moment recognizing there's complexity about how they all link together and recognizing there's a lot of confusion for all of us between what counts as a mechanism what counts as an outcome and what counts as a treatment so for, for example some of these things increasing self-compassion you might see that as an outcome you might see that as a mechanism towards achieving an outcome, or you might see that as a particular intervention. Each of these could in itself be a mechanism for another or an intervention for another. So those 30 research groups we're really excited about. We see them as being a part of the founding members of our new mental health science community. They're on our website, please go and have a look at them. And also look, they've each given us a key reference for their particular active ingredient. So, go, so you can go and look and see what the latest research is on that particular topic. I'm just picking out eight of them to just give you an example of the sorts of things and the diversity between them. And what we're doing now is bringing these groups together in groups of six people at a time, where once a month we get people together and talk about the relationship between the active ingredients and share learning. So these four people, for example, we range from Catherine Harmer from Oxford, who's looking at use of antidepressants, to Johannes Haushofer, who is split between the US and Kenya, who's looking at increased financial resource, in particular cash transfer. Then there's Kamala Iswaran in India, who's looking at engagement, theatre and arts. And Leanne Schmal in Australia, looking at re reduced levels of inflammation in the body. Now, one of the sort of exciting insights we already had, and I can't remember whether it was exactly these people in the group, but it was certainly some of them, was some of the interesting links that I wouldn't have predicted. So Leanne was telling us, for example, that there's some evidence in the literature she's looking at that reduced levels of information may link to social connectedness and social links. Johannes was telling us that one of them, so there's some really interesting research that he and others have done showing that just giving cash may have bigger impacts on improving depression in rural Kenya than actually giving psychotherapy or indeed adding psychotherapy to the cash transfer. And from his and others' work, one of the hypothesized uh, roots of that may be through reducing domestic violence. So there's a, a lot to be thought about here. Kamala was sharing that um, from her experience that where people are giving cash one of the other routes where it may help in terms of addressing or preventing anxiety and depression is it makes people feel valued and uh, may impact on self-esteem. So all sorts of interesting uh, learning and shared thinking. 
And we're aware that most of the focus of the interventions are on the individual or the interpersonal. And we think that's larger because that's where the literature is currently. But again, here, there's some really interesting concepts. And I think we have to be aware particularly of the jingle jangle fallacy. For those who don't know the jingle jangle fallacy, look it up on Wikipedia, it will blow your mind. Basically, it means that we sometimes use the same word to mean two different things. And in other times, we use two different words to use the same thing. And we would say mental health science is full of this. So we have commissioned people who are looking at compassion. We've commissioned people who are looking at perfectionism. They may actually be looking at some of the same things. Uh, for example, people looking at improved view of self may actually also link to compassion. So when you actually look at the actual items and the questions they're using, they may be more similar than they seem. And, and again, we're looking at a range of things from an increased sense of mattering Dean Ho in Singapore, working particularly with engineers and others to uh, rep reduce repetitive negative thinking. Image in Bell in Australia, who's also doing really interesting work on um, virtual reality and uh, digital work with both anxiety and depression and psychosis to Paul Badcock, who's looking at improving social relationships more generally. And then really excitingly to us, we had this fantastic tweet that made our Monday last week which was from Amy Finley-Jones, who is one of the members of one of the teams, uh, in fact, looking at increased self-compassion. Now, Amy's not the PR on that team. She's one of the other members on the team. And she tweeted us to say, I've looked at all the active ingredients you put out and I've had a go at fitting them together and here's my model. Do you want to join me in playing with this model, seeing how it might work? So she set up this group site on uh, Miro, we're now setting up a group uh, initiative for all the people that we're funding to try and get them to work together on it. But we want to make this wider. We want to involve other people in this. Everyone who's being funded by us gets this lovely badge of funded by Welcome to Advanced Science so no one is held back by mental health problems. But we want that badge to be much wider than this group. We want to really encourage all of you listening or as many of you listening as who's relevant to join us in this endeavor. So a couple of inspirational quotes to end with. Bill Gates, who predicted the pandemic, we always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. Since I have 10 years of this program, I'm hoping he's right, but you need to bear with me as we go through the first two years. And this fantastic quote from Maya Angelou, I've learned that people forget what you've said, people forget what you did, but people won't forget how you made them feel. So if by any chance I've made you feel enthusiastic about joining on this journey, whether we use the metaphor and analogy of cooking, that we're trying to cook these active ingredients and find the way, way forward, or weaving or knitting, or putting the puzzle pieces together, whichever metaphor fits for you, please join us. And with that, I will hand back to Claudia. Thank you so much, Miranda. I mean, that all sounds amazing. Is it? Is it? It must be great to have to have two hundred million pounds to give away for these things. What's that like? Is that great? I pinch myself every morning. I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. So we're already getting lots of questions through, and you were saying that you really want people to join you. And and one of the questions people, are of course, asking is how can they get involved in the work being done? Is it that they need to apply for grants, or are there are there other ways that they can get involved in this work? So the first thing I would say is social media. I don't think I'd ever thought I'd say this, but I would say this. There. So join us, follow us on Twitter, join the conversation, uh, join us on LinkedIn. We are trying to have this conversation as openly as possible. Um, whenever we have something that's open for a grant we'll, or, or a funding stream, we'll always put it up. I will always try and tweet about it, but also look on our website. So uh, join us. But if you have a great idea, send it to us. I can't promise we'll do anything with it, but always send us your great ideas. And we've got all, all sorts of lots and lots of questions coming through. Uh, one person asks, uh, could you tell us why you chose to focus on mental health problems rather than positive mental health or well-being? Yes, because we feel that about 450 million people are being held back every day by those problems. And that is the urgent challenge we're trying to uh, address. And is it is it challenging that whatever bits you decide to focus on, are you always going to get people saying, well, what about this bit and what about that bit? How, how are you dealing with that challenge? Um, yes. In fact, I predicted that would be a bigger challenge than it actually has turned out to be in the sense oh. that I think people understand why we're picking one bit. Doesn't mean we are interested in the other bits. And just to be clear, 
the wider welcome is open to all uh, funding requests for other areas of mental health. This is just the priority area. So there's other funding available and welcome around psychosis, around all sorts of other mental health issues. So, so don't, don't be put off from applying for other things. Um, but I think people understand that in a way, what has held the field back in some ways is that issue of the minute you try and do one thing, someone says, what about this? And then you can't move on because actually you can't come to, so, so biting off one bit is, is really crucial. And I think it's, it's, it's interesting, this, this whole idea of that all of these different subjects can come into mental health science and that you're, you're, you're looking across disciplines. Would you like to see a day when there are mental health science departments in each university rather than, you know, some people from psychology doing it, some people from psychiatry and neuroscience? And it, you need departments to be able to really do this. I feel mixed about that because I think any structural solution has its own bound. So then there'll be a boundary between the mental health science departments and the department of X or Y. So whichever way you cut it, whatever way you cut the cake, you are going to end up with boundaries. So actually, I don't think there's a perfect solution. I think it's more a mindset that we've got to leap over those boundaries. So one idea that I've been playing with, which my comms team will be furious that I'm going to mention, is that I invented a word which no one likes, but I'm going to share it at this moment called plexology which is the idea that we need plexologists, which are people that will weave across disciplines and that will jump over those barriers. Plex meaning to weave, ology uh -huh. purely to give it status. Completely made up word. So I think we need a plexology because no structure will contain it. However beautifully we design these institutions, it's not going to work. So we're going to have to find ways that people weave across. And for me, the people we've just been talking about, they're our first plexologists and we want other people to be those plexologists too. Plexology. We'll see if that catches on or yeah. not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm not predicting it will, and it's not going to be my formal uh, communication. Just to be <laughs> I quite like it. Um, and then there are some uh, more specific questions as well. So a member of the audience would like to know, with the uh, with mention, you mentioned the benefits of, of creativity. Um, do you see value in art psychotherapy for children and young people, even though it's been under-researched or possibly under-evidenced? So I think it's really important that we don't jump the other way. So I think so far we've been very skewed in the research and looking largely at talking therapies and medication and everything else has pretty much been virgin territory. We just don't know. We've got to be really careful. We don't then say because we haven't studied them, they must be fantastic and we just missed them. So they have to have the same rigor of study as anything else. It's just that we've got to make that rigor go to arts therapy and to arts generally. And I wouldn't make the distinction between therapy and arts. I think people, we, we want to look at the whole gamut of life experiences that may help. And uh, somebody says uh, there are interesting points you've made on fragmentation and the silos that people work in. Um, and, uh, you know, yesterday we were talking a lot about behavioral science. Um, do you think there needs to be more collaboration uh, within and beyond psychology in general with other subjects? Yes. 100% yes and I think it's a real I think it's human nature for us to be a bit territorial and I think the, the academic system is built on people creating their own empires and their own words like plexology so so um yeah in a way I think we've we've all got to find a new way of being collaborative and so one of the exciting impacts of this awful pandemic is that people have, have been forced to collaborate very quickly in new ways yeah. and if we can and now in a crisis it's easier to do that so can we hold on to that? Can we learn from that? Can we build new ways of being? Because whatever, whatever structures we create, there'll be new silos. Well, here's an offer from um, Saab, of course, the uh, CEO of the BPS, who we heard from this morning. Would the Wellcome Trust be interested in potentially match funding an area of work jointly with the BPS, working with other organisations like that? I can say unequivocally, yes, we are always looking for much funding. We are always looking to leverage and we're looking for sustainability in the field. Where we'd want to be really careful, Sub, and that sounds like a fantastic offer, is what we wouldn't want to be seen as, as prioritising one professional grouping. So as much as we could do that in a collaboration with a range of professional groupings, fantastic. And, you know, just to say your earlier remarks around things that we're all uh, struggling to rise to the challenge of Black Lives Matters, of addressing, of thinking about things in new ways. We are up for that, doing that with any like-minded organisations, either here or abroad. There we go. That's links built already today through yes, this. This, this is great. Um, and uh, another, oh, here's a good question from the audience. Your aim is to um, make sure that no one is held back by mental health problems, but how are you going to break through two smaller, hard to reach areas of populations? Really good question. So it's a 10 year programme. 
uh, and we see, and I guess the, the making sure no one has had that mental health problem, that's our vision for the world. So we don't think we can do that alone and we certainly can't do that in 10 years. What we want to do is try and work. So we want to be working on the science, but we need to be working with policymakers. We need to be working with communities. We need to be working with advocates to try and get into those communities and try and help build the resilience and the strengths and the approaches that are really going to make a difference for those different individuals. Um, and here's another why something not included question. Um, the active ingredients slide. Uh, somebody says, I would have thought that negative family situations would contribute to young people's mental ill health. Why is family not, not included? Good question. So um, th there are many things that are not included that people be shocked by. There's a survey open. It's open last day as today. Uh, it's on the LinkedIn page. Put in, so we put up the, the 26 active ingredients. And we've asked you can vote. You can say which are your top three which are the three that you think are least important, and then you can vote in an additional three. So go on there and vote in. The only thing I would say in response to that particular question is, again, it's a mind shift. It's away from what causes to what will help. So the question from, I would say back to them, and it may, they may say that is right, will intervening with families, is that the right active ingredient for 14 to 24 year olds? If it is, that's great, put it in. But if it's a question about what caused it in the first place, that may or may not be relevant as an active ingredient to what will help. So the analogy I use sometimes is it's like, and it's not a brilliant analogy, if you broke your leg and you went to the doctor and they spent a day asking you how you broke your leg, what <laughs> circumstances around it, and then said, come back in a month's time and then we'll start to discuss what to do next, you would be pretty horrified. I fear sometimes that is the attitude we're bringing to mental health. Isn't the difficulty though, that if the cause is still remaining, like all the things that you're going to trip over are still there in the house, then uh, it will happen again. And so you could have your intervention, but then if all those causes are still there of what's really causing it, don't you have to get to the root of that? I think that mental health has taken that argument too literally. So, so, so I would say that we have acted as if the only way to help is to know cause. There are many things that help where we don't understand why and where the cause may be one thing and the way of helping may be another. So, for example, it is perfectly possible to imagine a world in which, exactly as um, Sana said, the cause of the difficulties is to do with racism, systematic injustice, awful things, but it may help an individual to take a pill. Now, I'm not saying that is, and similarly, it may be the cause is purely biological and it may help an individual to have peer support and have community engagement. So in a way, because we've got those, those debates got caught in this head to head around social versus biological, we've got a bit stuck. And if we could just like breathe a bit, it's not the cause isn't important, of course it's important. I'm just, I'm just trying to swing back a bit to allow ourselves a bit of space to think through what might help separate. We do have a question here about about the sort of bigger picture as well. So does the project provide avenues to lobby for change if there are government policies that are contributing to mental health problems, particularly in certain groups in the UK? Can you do that sort of thing through this project? Uh, yes, uh, as long as it's in line with the science. So mental health, so Welcome is a mental health, is a science funder and, and does science and culture. It does do policy and advocacy, but I don't want to take away from other advocacy groups. So we would link with other advocacy groups, but we aren't ourselves uh, as a purely advocacy body. So for example, there's a fantastic organization I would recommend people might want to join called United for Global Mental Health, which is looking to advocate for global mental health and trying to bring global mental health advocates together internationally. Uh, you know, and we, we link with them, but we are distinct from them in our aims. Our aim is to bring the best science to bear on that, to help as part of the wider community to create a world in which no one is held back. Now, it's interesting that you said you're you know, unapologetic about using the word science. And there's a question here about that from somebody saying, relating to the stigma of, of psychology as sometimes as a soft science, how do we overcome this stigma so that we can then further mental health science? So I think it is like just just stick with calling it a science. I think that the idea of sh I think this acronym shape to go alongside STEM and I can't now remember what each of the letters in shape stands for, but I, it was social historical. I don't remember, but yeah, the shape acronym I think is helpful. But I think really the way of um, addressing that is don't be soft, be rigorous. So you know, it, it basically, if you're rigorous, there's, there is soft stuff being done under all sorts of guises. Mm -hmm. I think the key thing is to be open to debate, be rigorous and be and don't be an advocate for your own beliefs. So if you are basically using anything to advocate for your own beliefs as opposed to being rigorous and neutral, then you're not doing science. And whether that's stem or shape. Yeah. 
Yeah, very interesting. Um, and uh, here's one which I should think would be very popular if the answer is yes. Are there specific opportunities for undergraduates or for new graduates to, to get involved? You mentioned getting involved on, on social media. Are there, are there going to be bigger opportunities than that? There are. And in fact, we run a variety of internships and graduate schemes. So please look on our website, um, particularly looking to uh, ensure that we're inclusive and diverse and representing underserved groups. Um, so look on our website. There's a whole range of schemes on there. Really encourage you to get involved. Uh, another member of the audience asked, is there any focus on the role of schools in prevention and intervention? Absolutely. So it, it's wherever we can find people and wherever we feel the evidence is best. So we're neutral as to where the best way of doing it. And we're, at this stage in these first two foundational years, we're just trying to understand how those active ingredients might work and where they might work. And we've had a couple of questions about obviously, you know, access to services and, and delivery of services and uh, changes in secondary mental health care. Um, which does sort of bring us to a bigger question about even that, you know, after, after your 10 years and you have the research and you know what works, how do you then get that into place and get the funding for that? It's all very well to know what works, but if services aren't available, then what can be done? We, we already do know some things that work. We do. We have a, sl a slightly radical view on that as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are neutral as to what is the best way of approaching this and whether services are the only way of doing that. So I would say that, um, again, the advocacy community has been very focused on addressing stigma and access to services, both of which I completely believe in and we need to address stigma and we need to have better access to services. However, because people have had to advocate so hard, perhaps it hasn't been as publicly open how little we know about what works for whom and why and how many people are not helped by existing services not because people aren't well-meaning and trying their very best, but because we just don't yet know what works for everyone. And actually we need really to expand our vision beyond talking therapies and medications, the only option to a range of other things that may help. So when we talk about scalability, services no doubt will be part of that, but how big a part of that they will be and what other things there may be, what other options out there, I think we, that needs to be discovered by the community. So what sort of things might there be that aren't, aren't services? So, I mean, if we take seriously the uh, Johannes' research on cash transfers, if we give people money, and if that is the thing that really affects their depression and anxiety, that may be a different way of structuring how we think about interventions, for example. Yeah, so that fits in with actually a question just come in, how much emphasis are you putting on financial inequality as a cause of poor mental health, as in the book uh, that many people will know, Spirit Level. So, so you are looking at that kind of thing. We are, but again, not at cause, only in terms of intervention. So, the, and I think this is a mind shift that takes a while to get used to. So we're interested in, is there evidence that actually addressing that, so whatever caused the problems, is there evidence that addressing financial inequality then either helps prevent or treat or stop relapse or manage ongoing difficulties? And similarly, you know, we're, nothing is out of scope. So if we find that exercise or sleep or... Uh, antidepressants or talking therapies we're interested in whatever it is that makes a difference but we're not separating out here are professional things and here are non-professionals we're saying everything we want to understand the active ingredients because we may find some of the things that are currently embedded in services can be done in other ways we just haven't looked at them that's why we're so part of the reason for having a focus on active ingredients is trying to disaggregate some of the things that are currently seen as if they're one thing so you mentioned uh, structural inequality and how that was something that might be looked at, you know, along the way in the future. And then one way that seems a very, very big thing to try to change. But uh, would you be looking to see whether there are perhaps interventions that can make a difference to the structural inequalities in one particular area that might still make a difference to people's lives? Yeah. 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 That's, that's, yeah I think that's the, difficulty, the difficulty is finding the literature to help us do it and, and if necessary we need to fund it to find to find best ways of doing rigorous science in this area yes and that could be quite a challenge because that could be yeah that could be something that's that's um that's quite big uh, that's quite big to need to do um and um what sort of um feedback are you getting so far i mean because it, as you say it is quite a radical approach you're taking and everybody is used to protecting their their own areas and thinking, well, it's, you know, it's clinical psychologists who look after mental health or it's, it's whoever. What, how is that panning out? Is that difficult? So far, I've been amazed by how positive the feedback and interaction is. 
Of course, one of the things I've discovered since I've been a fund, and I've been a fund now for a year and a month, is that everyone's very polite to your face when you've got 200 million pounds to give away. <laughs> they are. And, and appropriately so, and I'm not encouraging anyone to stop that. But it does make it a bit hard for me to know if people are really feeling... Uh, very concerned so we're trying to find ways like surveys and other things that people can give more negative feedback that we can hear um, so you know I really do welcome people sharing in the debate and sharing their consternation but generally I've been amazed by how positive people have been and how excited they are to be as part of this journey and we're really building on everyone the shoulders of fantastic work that's being done and there's such energy in the community and some really and one of our things we really want to encourage early career researchers who have got such great ideas mm. so my main message is don't be afraid just come out share tweet share your ideas it may take i may not be able to get back to everyone but i will try and i think it's about trying to encourage people to share with each other and join us in the community building and I noticed that it said you, you mentioned in the in the abstract for your um, keynote that mental health uh, research, research in the mental health sciences is, is, is decades behind, uh, that it's behind where it should be. Why? Why do you say that? And, and why do you think that is? So in terms of the outcomes we're achieving for anxiety and depression, they haven't improved as far as I'm aware, substantially for the last 20 to 30 years. We're still using treatments that were invented in the 1950s. Not that they're wrong. There's some really great things we've learned. And as you say, great things that we should be rolling out more. But we haven't had the advances that other fields have had in terms of transformative like that. And then this really works, that really works. We just haven't had it. And I think part of that is to do with, not because we haven't got great people, but because we've got very caught in particular sorts of debate and particular ways of seeing the world. Plus, I think we have been quite limited in the populations we've looked at. So I don't know whether you've heard the acronym WEIRD, standing yes. for Western Industrialized, Educated, Rich and Developed. Well, most of the research in much of psychology, as you know, and uh, particularly in mental health science, has been on weird communities. And more than that, it's been on weird communities happen to access healthcare. So given that most people with mental health problems never go anywhere near a mental health service, um, actually, by studying just the weird group that says healthcare, we have missed out on huge swathes of the population that, for example, are recovering by other means that we don't know about. So large numbers of people only ever have depression once. They've heart barely been studied. So we barely, we don't really know what's helped those people actually get over that depression because we've been so focused on the ones that, that end up in the health service. So we've got, we've got a real shift of perspective and a real opportunity now to unleash the power of population data look globally look at low resource settings and think anew and you know again a sort of a sad but positive effect of the pandemic has been people moving to virtual and, and trying out new things in a way that perhaps they were a bit more nervous of doing before and are there enough researchers working in this field to be able to to do all the work that you can fund no we want to encourage as many as possible to come in the field we want we want both old blood and new blood. We want to encourage people. We want to grow the field and we want to bring in a diversity of perspectives. So you know, anyone that um, we, we want to encourage people to join the field. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what we're going to do now is people have a choice of um, they have three options, well, which is rather exciting. So you can stay with uh, Miranda and with me and uh, we have some more time for um, for meet the keynote. If there are things you want to more things you want to ask or or things on a wider topic you want to ask, you can ask about, you know, Miranda's career or, or whatever you like there. Um, or there is also another online session uh, with Wiley, who are the uh, headline sponsors for the whole conference. And that is on publishing with impact. So if you want to know how to get your uh, research published and some tips from the journals there then uh, do join that there is a link to that in your um, joining information that you've had the third option is that you are allowed to have lunch I mean you are allowed to have lunch after these both these things anyway you just get a shorter lunch break and I was I was quite interested yesterday people were tweeting what they had for their lunch and there was cheese on toast there were all sorts of interesting things people had because of course we all get to have different lunches instead of being at a conference where we have the same thing so that was interesting to see what you have today um, so if you are doing that then please remember that you can do um, if you're going for lunch there is uh, you can do, put in feedback on Slido uh, for how you found uh, the sessions uh, today and we are starting again at one o'clock today remember so um, do be back with us for one o'clock um, if you're going to the uh, Wiley session or to um, to have your lunch um, and uh, I will see you 
the rest those of you who do that at one o'clock and we will carry on i'll carry on chatting with miranda we have some more um some more questions coming in um Oh, this is interesting. In relation to stigma, is there any focus on neurodiversity? You talked about siloed and diagnoses. Are you having any focus on neurodiversity at all? Uh, it's certainly not out of scope, but it's not. A, it, so I think insofar as it comes within anxiety and depression, uh, yes. And uh, there's also a question, what are your thoughts on new, um, newish, uh, you know, third wave therapies like MI, ACT, et cetera? Would you consider them a promising new direction to take? These interventions I think again what we're trying to do with the with some of these um, new therapies is trying to work out what's the active ingredient within them so in a way we'd want to disaggregate them at this moment we're trying to sort of like look at what the building blocks are or the ingredients in the cooking recipe so if you think about those as being the recipes we're interested in the moment of what are the ingredients and then we want to see how do they link together so in a way we're a bit agnostic to any particular therapy it's more about and, and it might be that some of them share some active ingredients. So that's what the, the task we're on at the moment. We're hunting for the ingredients. Yes, yeah, so you're trying to get to the real essence of what's actually happening here and what's actually making a difference. I thought it was interesting what you were saying about the, and I will be Googling, the jingle jangle fallacy. I didn't know that one. Um, and I thought that was really interesting that you say that, you know, that, that some of the research crosses over. They seem like they're such different things, I like your perfectionism and um, self-compassion example. We think they're different, but do they all cross over? Yeah. And has that, how hard has that been uh, getting people to engage with um, their thinking that their research is the same as something else? So again, I've been amazed. So, you know, we had this really fantastic week where those 30 people that we funded all met together in these groups of, of five or six. And just the excitement as they shared the ideas, you could sort of feel the, the buzz. So, I, you know, I, but one of them pointed out to me, well, to us, so the, this project is led by my colleague, Dr. Kat Sebastian, who heads up our, um, who's our uh, evidence lead. And um, this person was pointing out to Kat and I that uh, one of the difficulties is academic careers are made by sort of like saying, this is my thing and I've created this special thing and only I know about it. So they were saying they had no interest in doing that themselves, but in a way they were forced into it by the structures. So again, I think we need to think, how can we help structure things so that, that because the individuals don't want to do it they, they they're in it because they love and they want to understand the learning so how do we help that flourish yes because the individuals of course need to go through the ref and so on and they need to publish in certain journals and they need to do what their department needs them to do as well as yeah as well as um what um what they want to do um oh and here's an interesting question how does your work fit into the work on trans diagnostic approaches to mental health so we thought long and hard about this. So I, we, we've deliberately taken a very broad brush view of what anxiety and depression are. Mm -hmm. So you, in a way, we are very aligned to transdiagnostic approaches. We just we didn't want to keep it so broad that we would get confused around what we were talking about. So in a way, I don't mind whether you talk about it in terms of diagnosis or no diagnosis. What I'm interested in is what holds people back and the sort of things we're interested in at this moment in terms of what holds back and the sort of things that are in that um table around which which traditionally have been linked to anxiety and depression and so and are, are you so are, and are you keeping it to only anxiety and depression in a way i mean what about you know psychosis and other other issues so for the priority area so exactly that so for this for the priority we're interested in the sort of things like not being able to sleep feeling very despondent we're not looking, for example, at hallucinations or hearing voices for this priority area, but we have a whole psychosis flagship, which is doing a whole road of innovations mm. in Welcome, and we will in time expand. It's just that we wanted to start somewhere. Yes, yes, no, I can see that, that you do need to start somewhere. Um, and we have a very uh, a specific question about, because uh, you, you put up the, the, the photo of the, um, uh, the photo of them as mentioning self-harm that, that, that won the competition. Um, uh, and this is not about that photo, but more generally, somebody asks, do you think there's a danger of um, glorifying, of youngsters glorifying self-harm through sharing pictures where they do portray self-harm? Yes, yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah, and evidence would, would suggest that. And what is what um what is you what was your field yourself? You know, I think of you as a as a, um, uh, as a sort of mental health me mental health scientist. But are you from psychology or or I am from psychiatry or it was, it was yeah. sort of? So I, in fact, my under, my undergraduate degree was in history. Oh. I then did an MA in history, 
and then I um, transferred into clinical. I did a sort of in the days before they had transfer course, I did a sort of psychology changeover, and yeah. then uh, became a clinical psychologist and worked as a clinician for many years in the health service. Um, and then moved into academia, and now I have a part-time post as professor of evidence-based practice at UCL. Mm -hmm. Also, I've run not-for-profit organisations and worked in a charity. So I, I suppose I do see myself as 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 broad. And I guess I feel um, I, I never had that undergraduate experience of psychology. So although I have got a clinical psychologist, I perhaps have a have a more complicated relationship with what it means to be a psychologist than some who've come through the whole system. And are you still, are you glad that you did do history though, and that you did do the history MA? Does that shape things you, you've done as well? Do you know what? Funnily enough, I really am. Um, I mean, at the time, I felt very cross with my teachers who had persuaded me not to do psychology, said, no, 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 you're not interested in psychology, you're interested in, in history. Um, but actually, I loved the degree, I loved history, and I do think it's given me a different perspective. And, and in particular, I wrote a paper, which I would encourage people to read, about FUPS data, data that's flawed, uncertain, proximate and sparse, and about how we must use FUPS data to make decisions in mental health. And that was very much informed by having been trained as a historian about how you use fragmentary evidence and how you can't go back and do controlled experiments. All you've got is the data you've got and you've got to draw inferences. And I think much of psychology is like that in that actually you just, you can't control for all the variables you need to control for. So actually you're then left with inference and then how do you do that rigorously? And history is all about doing that rigorously without being able to control. So in many ways, huh. I, I feel those skills are some of the things we need for some of the complexity that we're dealing with. Uh, I think that's really interesting because I think sometimes people will say, oh, sometimes people will say to me in psychology, well, the evidence, we can't make recommendations on this yet because all the evidence isn't there yet. Um, we need to wait. Whereas I, I suppose historians, as you say, you can never go back and get any more. So you did have to make your best bet, if you like. I completely, and I feel that very strongly that should be our answer even now. So you're never going to have all the evidence. It, 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 so it's just, you, you've still got to make your best bet now. And so our task as scientists, whether we are a scientist coming from humanities or a scientist coming from STEM, is to really think about what does the evidence say? Am I making sure I'm being self-critical? I'm not just picking the evidence that suits my internal beliefs. What does it really say? And then on, my, on that, what inference would I draw? Um, and somebody says, as a clinical psychologist, um, this is interesting, how, how have you managed to detach yourself from the difficult things that you um, see or hear about when you were working as a clinician? It's a really good question. So I haven't worked as a clinician for many years. And one of the things I, I generally say is that the further I get away from doing clinical work, the easier and simpler the clinical problems seem to me. And I really yeah. remember when I was doing clinical work, just how hard and how um, emotionally draining it was. <clears throat> if you care you can't completely detach yourself so you know i i would say since i've stopped doing clinical work there were bits i really miss about clinical work so when it when someone was 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 flourishing in some way it was the most fantastic experience in the world and when they weren't it was a very upsetting experience and i think most clinicians carry that responsibility sort of within them the whole time mm -hmm. so i suppose i'm very aware that that i have the luxury of not carrying that responsibility and I'm very um, respectful and uh, in awe of the people that carry that and work with people and are by, beside people as they go on their journeys. Um, and uh, a member of the audience says, how can alternative mental health practitioners get involved in this kind of thing in an evidence-based and useful way? I think, again, it's about rigour. So I think the main thing I think is it's, if, if your reason for getting involved is because you want to prove what you're doing is the right thing and you want it to be funded for that reason, then, then, then this is not for you. If the reason to get involved is because you are genuinely curious about what are the best ways of helping either prevent or treat mental health problems, then get involved. But if it's about marketing, which a lot of the research can be, whether it's from alternative or not alternative, then that is when it stops being science for me. Yeah, interesting. Uh, somebody says they'd just like to ask about uh, what's the uh, impact of adverse relationships through social dominance, things like bullying, abuse and exploitation, um, are the impact on, on mental health of those things. How much do we know about that? There's, there's a lot of evidence that those things have a massive negative impact. Yeah. Uh, and somebody says, with a history degree, do you feel, do you not feel that the case for income equality as a solution to mental health difficulties has already been established that income equality is the thing that will make the difference well 
I'm really interested to, say, to, to know from whoever asked that what evidence they're drawing on. So where in the world has a, an intervention happened where the income equality has come in and we have no mental health problems? And if we can find that place and replicate what they're doing, yeah, fantastic. But I'm not aware that there is that evidence and quite that clarity. I see what you mean. So again, you're looking for an intervention. So we may be able to see that there may be a lower incidence of mental health problems where there is lower inequality and higher when there's higher. But that doesn't mean the same as looking at the intervention. I think that's a really interesting, uh, really interesting uh, distinction there. Um, let me see if there are any questions that we have not uh, covered yet. Just want to check I haven't missed any out in this list, because if I have... Uh, Oh, yes, here's an interesting one, actually, about COVID and about language. Um, in relation to COVID-19, what do you think the mental health implication of the word shielded is? Does it not feel like it's um, labelling people um, and labelling them as being apart from others? Have you thought at all about the word, the word shielded? I hadn't until they mentioned it, but I would say all words are loaded in one way or another. So again, it's a bit like the discussion about whether we should have mental health science departments. I think if you create a new world, that would be loaded in different ways. So I, I feel again, we've got to just find ways of getting over the word problems and just say, we know what they were trying to get at. You know, let's try and make sure that isn't how those people feel it, but fighting over the word, I'm not sure is the best way of actually addressing that. That's really interesting. And I suppose there are sort of worse, but like it could be isolated, might feel even worse than the word shielded. And it does mean being apart from people, unfortunately, because of the situation. And, and I yeah. think different people experience words very differently. And, and a lot of it is to do with, you know, how that what they, whether they trust who said the word and what they think the intent behind it is. And, you know, so and they might feel differently at about different times. So and different generations might feel differently. So I think Again, I would really encourage us not to get too caught in fights over words if we can avoid it. And is that something you have managed to um, somehow politely stop in some of the meetings and gatherings that you've you've had? Again, I've been amazed. I thought that would be a real issue, but I think people are really hungry to actually talk about what will help. So I, I haven't experienced it as a problem but um, one of the things I want to check if we have got time I'd like to ask some of the questions you were going to be asked like about how you interview people what tips would you give us from your experience of interview how do you bring people together how do you help use language how do you interview people to get the best out of them yeah how do you get the evidence in ways that really help people understand because I think you've got those skills so I yeah just while I've got you I thought I might ask <laughs> well, you've got me here um well I think uh I think it's interesting actually because one of the things one of the sort of parallels is that one of the things we're often doing in discussions is, is bringing together people from different areas and one of my favorite ever things is when when we're in the building obviously we don't have many guests in the building at the moment so but when we do have and we can't have them for discussions but when we have discussions with different people that um i love it when i'm leaving broadcasting house and showing them showing them out in reception and then they start chatting to each other and exchanging details and saying should we do some research together and then the people will often say to me how on earth did you know about their research because it is linked to mine but it's a different field it's a bit like the perfectionism and self-compassion thing so people don't i think people um are you know you're, you're forced to work in such You've got to work really in depth and so then you don't necessarily know what else is going on but because i do the opposite of working in depth and look across lots of things instead you see those things and i love it when that then links links people up it's like my private psychology matchmaking service so that private psychology matchmaking second that connector we've got to find ways of building that into the systems because whatever structure is never going to work but we need people like you and you are doing so amazing you know amazing stuff on the sort of you know uh, broadcasting stage in terms of getting this out there but we need lots of other junior you know doing that doing that connecting which is i guess was part of the plexology idea so yeah anything you well, interestingly about? one thing one one sort of it sounds so obvious tip that i would give people is that often people will say how did you find that other person who's also doing something that's a bit similar and the answer was google but not with the word that they call their research <laughs> with more lay words that I might use that aren't in that research. And that Googling the, the word plus research plus university plus UK, if UK is what you're looking at for world service programs or, or other programs where we're doing global things, it'll be different. But if you put those things in, you do find, and, and you know, only sort of, you know, on the second page or maybe the third page, you've got to go down a bit, you will find people doing stuff that is linked to your area, but that you might not think of as linked to your area. And honestly, that is how we often find people. Um, Brilliant. Yeah. 
So um, Google, Google is my tip there. Um, and uh, what else were you asking about how, how to do it? I mean, one, one is to try to, um, uh, to, to try to encourage people not to use the technical language that they would use, the jargon that they would use from their particular subject. And if it's recorded in advance, I'll often stop and get, you know, get people to say it again to constantly make sure that we're using language that people can understand. Um, and sometimes it's more challenging when I'm having a discussion where there are people from different fields who want to use a different word for their word. And both will see that if I use that word or the, the other one's word, that I'm then saying we should look at it from that perspective, that I'm medicalizing it or demedicalizing it or which, whichever way around it is. And so then I will quite often, I will think quite carefully about the language I use and will quite often try to use a mixture of all of those words or use none of the technical words at all and use a lay term that, that I hope will be acceptable to the most people. But it is also, of course, uh, where you do get emails from listeners about which words are used, say, to do with to do with mental health some people i know is for example hate the phrase service user uh some people want us to use the phrase service user and don't like any other phrases that there might be so for them what i try and do is scatter a mixture because uh you you, you can't please all the people all the time but you can you can displease them less often if you spread it sprinkle it about if you see what i mean which is you know which is one way of of doing it um Oh, here's an interesting uh, uh, couple more questions. Um, to your knowledge, has the mental health of young people worsened or improved since lockdown? That's a really good question. And I think we have to be really careful about assuming we know the answer. Um, and it may vary hugely between group to group. So one thing uh, we have welcome have funded is Daisy Fancourt, who is at UCL, who has her own uh, survey on this, but she's all, what we've funded in particular is that she has brought together all, I think it's over 90 now different longitudinal surveys being currently done on the impact of COVID. So have a look on her website, it's called COVID Mind, and it has all the, the, the surveys and all their results are available. And so you can go on there and make your own decision. And she publishes, I think it's either a weekly or a monthly update on what she's finding. Um, and somebody asked, do you plan to do longitudinal studies as well? If you do some preventative work earlier, young people may have a different experience later on. How, how far ahead are some of these studies going to look? Absolutely. So I think we'll be looking at trying to see what funding we can put in place for that. We've got a sort of idea around living labs, which is the idea that we'll be working with cohorts where you're following people in the population through time, but using them then to test out which approaches might work and which approaches might not work. So I think, and that's what we're testing that out with this idea of this population data bank that we're commissioning at the moment to see if that works as a model. Um, uh, oh, that's interesting. Regarding culture. Are you studying cultural and personality factors that could influence the intervention that you're doing? And will you be collaborating with other countries? I mean, you mentioned some, I saw some people from Australia on there, for example, but is this going to be, how global is it? It's, a, it's, a, it's very much a global programme and we're particularly interested in low middle income countries and low resource settings. So we'll be doing work, we think, almost definitely in India and in parts of Africa, possibly South Africa and uh, Kenya as well, we're currently considering at the moment. And I think it's interesting, this question about cultural personality, that it might be some interventions work better for some individuals and some work better for others. Um, and if you just do it, obviously, generally, then you, you may not get an efficacy that looks that high. But is there a way of finding out how you can target what works for whom? Completely. And that's why, that, sorry, again, if we use the analogy of the ingredients, they might not all be people's taste or some may be allergic. Yeah, it may be <laughs> harmful to another person. So um, one of the things we're doing for this current commission for these 30 research groups, their explicit task is to say who it works for, but also who it doesn't work for and what the characteristics are of those different groups. So that's exactly the sort of thing we want to look at. And, and I think the issue of harm has been understudied in our field. So also trying to understand who it may actually be harmful for is also useful. Mm. Um, and here's a good one to end with. Uh, what is the one piece of advice that you can give anyone at undergraduate level who's looking to pursue a career as a clinical psychologist? Ooh, um, You're allowed to, if you like. Okay, my one bit of advice is don't give up. If, you, if that's what you want to do, go for it. That would be my main bit of advice. Um, and uh, in order to make it most likely that you will pursue it, I guess it will be just try and look at what the reality of, of being a clinical psychologist is, whether it's in books or videos or YouTubes or talking to people, um, because there's a huge variety of things that you can do within that. Um, so just trying to find what fits and where your skills will be best placed is um, 
helpful. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for that, Miranda. We've had, we've, we've had you on for an hour and 20 minutes now, which is a long time, I realise, to be put on the spot. Um, so thank you very much. That was a fantastic talk. And thank you for all your answers as well. So remember, people can put their feedback into uh, Slido. Um, and um, we will be back at uh, one o'clock uh, when we've got the, uh, it's a really interesting panel on COVID-19 um, and the media, which I think is sure to be good. But thank you so much, Miranda. Great to talk to you. Thank you Thanks. very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye, bye, everyone, lunch. and enjoy your lunchtime. And remember, there's another link for this afternoon. So um, do go back into your uh, list of links to get this afternoon's link, and we'll see everyone then. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank bye.